had the day off, but I just had no idea. Crip right up on it. It's the first first Monday of every September, I believe, is what it is, and that's going to be tomorrow. So tomorrow we've got the day off, Labor Day, federal holiday in the United States, celebrated on the first Monday of September to honor and to recognize American labor, American what we do, uh, the contributions of laborers and the development and the achievements of the United States. Now at the time, you have to think about the 1880s, and really it was probably a, many decades leading up to this, but it was before they, that the workers unionized, it was before the, 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 the laborers got together and said, hey, we're not going to do this anymore, it's bad for our kids, it's bad for us, uh, the working conditions are terrible. A work day was 12 hours in the United States, and so nowadays, if you were to say you need to work a 12-hour day, a lot of people would groan and they would moan, but at, at a time, it was very normal. Uh, there's a time, even for a farmer, where you work sun up to sun down because you've got well, hundreds of acres that you have to tend to and you have to rub your fences, you have to feed and water your animals, no, uh, you maybe have to go help a cow give birth or you need to slaughter a pig. You know, it was normal part of an agriculture or an agrarian society to work 12 or more hours. Uh, but in the 1880s and the 1890s, men got together and with the Industrial Revolution just decided, hey, we're going to have this holiday, you're going to recognize it, we're not working more than eight hours, and if we do, you're going to have to pay us more. Now, praise God, I, I love working, I love having an eight-hour uh, expectation on my birthday and not 12. I think that's great. You know, but we're, we're living in a day, we're living in an age in which there seems to be no rest, no rest for the weary. I mean, I know it, and you know it, when we wake up, we didn't get a lot of sleep last night. We maybe got an hour. You know, maybe we got eight, but we don't feel like we got eight. And so people are starting to tell me, well, you need a better pillow. You need a better mattress. You need to regulate your body temperature better. You need to ground your sheets. Uh, ground would mean like literally run a wire from your sheets and your mattress, lay on a, an electrode pad that is going to ground you to the earth outside. And so then you imagine, what if lightning strikes outside? Is that going to backflow and like electrocute my family? And, and so there's all sorts of things out there, but the point is, what's going on? Why is, there, there just seems to be no rest in the world. Why, why are we working these jobs day after day after day? Why is it that we, no matter what, still feel tired? We don't feel like we're getting ahead. You know, we're not where we expect it to be. We're not where we want to be. The expectation that we maybe had for ourselves is, has died. What happened? Why is there seemingly no rest for the weary? Most people have to work multiple jobs. Multiple jobs just to make ends meet. Yeah, California, $20 minimum wage for a, uh, somebody who's flipping burgers. Well, guess what California is going to do? They're going to, if it starts in California, it usually spreads across all of the other states eventually. Uh, so $20 minimum wage, what's going to happen is there's no longer going to be a job for you because they're going to invent a machine or robot, and you've seen it implemented here, that's going to do that job. And then eventually, the people who make the food in the back are gonna be replaced by robots because I'm not gonna pay you 20 hours. And if, and if I'm gonna pay you $20, then I'm not gonna give you 40 hours, I'll give you 14. I'll give you 14 hours a week because I got a machine that can do it. And there's no law that says I can't. We're living in this day, and we're living in this age where most people have to work multiple jobs to pay their debts. And it seems like money is this blood this blood of the system that we have to have it in order to live, we have to have it in order to operate, we have to have it in order to continue forward with our lives. There's something that is called, and this is a real thing, I looked it up, it's called chronic fatigue syndrome. Imagine living your life, you, imagine living your life at 10% battery all the time. So sometimes, you know, you wake up, you got seven hours of sleep. Praise God, that's probably a lot, that's a lot for me. You're at 70% of your power. You feel pretty good when you go out at 70%. You get a little bit of coffee, it helps, you know. But just imagine that you're at only 10% operational power for yourself, for your entire life. It's chronic fatigue syndrome. It's a clinical thing. I have a, a work tablet that my, my job has given me. It's no doubt a first generation iPad, okay? And so if you know anything about their battery system, you know that they break down over time, just like any mechanical thing. So now it takes all night to charge uh, to 100% usually, and then if I go at 100% and I go and I carry on my day, I use my tablet for work, interacting with customers and GPS, I'll come home and I'm usually around 30 or 
Now it takes eight hours. I mean, I get home, I plug that thing in, and it probably takes eight hours to get from 30% to 100%. There's something wrong with that. It, it, it now imagine your life is the exact same way. You don't have anything to recharge you, and you're, you're worn out. You have this chronic fatigue that's in your life. You know, it, 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 it takes a long time to charge, and it takes a very short amount of time for it to die. And really, probably everybody in, in some point or in some degree suffers from that chronic fatigue syndrome, whether you're doing it to yourself by not exercising, stretching, or nutritionally eating the right things that's fueling this race car, this high performance vehicle that you have and you're not taking care of it, or maybe it's spiritually, maybe, maybe it's a mental issue, maybe it is a physical issue. All of us suffer from this fatigue in our own lives. It's absolutely true. Our bodies are breaking down every single day. The sun's against us. The air we breathe is oxidizing us. We're, we're literally rusting from the inside out. You know, everything, it seems, is against us. But there is one who can give us rest, and his name is Jesus. All right, you're in Isaiah chapter 40. Look at verse 27, standing. Standing with me, Isaiah chapter 40. We'll read responsibly 27 through 31, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 27. I'll start, we'll read every other together until we get all the way to 31, right there, before the end of the chapter. Verse 27, I'll start. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? And altogether, hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth their strength. Thank you, Lord. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Lord, we love you. Lord, we need you. And, and God, we're living in this world in which there's seemingly no rest. We get tired, even the youths, even the young people, even the people with all of the energy in the world, God, says that they will faint also. But God, you give us a promise in the Bible that we can have our strength renewed as eagles. Lord, we ask now at this time that we would just calm down, we would settle down, we would open our hearts. We'd lift the gates that are around our eyes and our ears and we'd allow your word to come in. Lord, allow me to decrease and for you and your word to absolutely increase. Take control of this service at this hour and this time. And please, Lord, I would just simply ask that your word would do what it does best, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Everybody suffers from fatigue in some way or another. Matthew chapter 11, you can turn there with me. We're going to spend much of the remaining time we have right there in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew, the first of the Gospels, the first put in the Gospels, that is. Matthew chapter 11, and I wanted to point out a few more verses. Matthew Chapter 11 and verse 28. If you'll look at verse 28, we'll read 28, 29, and 30 together. And I will read out. And you can follow along. That's Matthew chapter 11. And then verses 28 all the way down to 30. Right here, I'll read it. A message that comes from Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Stop. Now, to me, to you, to the reader who takes the Bible seriously, that looks like a promise from God. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God has gave a, given us a promise right there, knowing that the, the flesh, our, the fleshly tabernacle that we have and the Holy Ghost comes inside and lives in, is weak. Our spirit that's within us is, is, 
It doesn't have those physical limitations like our bodies do, the flesh does. And so he knows, Jesus Christ knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our flesh is exceedingly wicked. It's exceedingly uh, weak, but he also knows that the spirit is, is desirous. The, the, the spirit truly desires the, the righteousness and the things uh, of God that, that, that he perfectly uh, imbues and embodies. Now we have this common problem, each and every single one of us, we're humanity, and it, it, it's simply that we're all tired of something. We're tired of something, we're tired from something, but we're just, we're tired. You know, the shoulders, what happens, they slump forward, the head goes down, man, the eyes start to get droopy, we're all just, we're fatigued, we're tired, we're beat up, we're torn down. We have this, this flesh, and as we get older, some things start to become normal, when the check engine light comes on, the TPMS, or uh, something comes on in the vehicle, you can take it to the auto shop and they'll fix it, you know? But with your body, sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes we start to learn to live with it. You know, the crick in the neck that you get every once in a while, you've got the ankle that, that, that pops a certain kind of a way, you realize, you, I can't lift what I used to lift, I realize I can't get on ladders like I used to get on ladders. And we start to live with it, and, and so that stays with us. And then a couple years down the road, something else. And then maybe we start to go down the road more and more and more, and we see that we have more and more and more issues and fatigues and problems with our bodies. And it's normal. It's normal. It's part of life. Man, heaven's going to be awesome. We're going to have that new glorified body, and all of those things that we struggle and deal with now are going to be gone and away. Now, you young people, you're not worried about it right now, but I'm telling you, you just wait. It's going to be right about when you get your 30s. And that's what it was for me. I started to notice things are different. Uh, and so just be aware of that. You're not worried about it now. You're invisible. All right, a common problem. We're all tired. Each and every one of us are tired from something. Now, fatigue, you realize this, you know, that, can, that it can uh, occasionally overtake even the strongest of us. I don't care who you are. If we all started running, we're going to have people that drop out after a mile. We're going to have people to drop out after two miles. Maybe even 10 miles, there's three of us left. But at 20 miles, there's only going to be one of us left. Even the strongest person is going to get fatigued, is going to get worn out at some point because we're human, because we have flesh. We're tired physically and mentally from the everyday struggle, even just to make ends meet. You know, we got to. We, we have to work because I have to provide for my family. I have to provide for myself. I've got to eat. I need shelter. I need water. I need security. I need to know that I feel safe. I have to have transportation. You know, there's certain things that we just need. And as we go to meet these needs, well, it wears us down because we have to deal with all sorts of things in the world in order to receive that money in exchange for our life so that way we can provide. Now, Christian, you out there in the world, and you try, and you try, and you try, and you do your best to make a living. And then day, day in, and day out, day after day, it, it starts to wear you down. I got news for you. You're normal. We're all going through it. We're all going through the same thing. I don't understand how you customer service folks do it, though. Uh, I, I really just, I have a hard time. Soul winning helps. Brother, soul winning helps you if you have a problem. If you have issues dealing with difficult people, go out soul winning. But let's just imagine the people who are on the windows of, uh, of the drive through place. And that's why I love going to Chick-fil-A. They never give you attitude. They always give you good service. They say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Right away, they'll run at you with your food and they'll give it to you. And uh, They're just, they're kind. They're, they're helpful. You know, their service is good. Their chick, that's God's chicken right there. I tell you what, <laughs> that's God's chicken. Uh, you know, I don't understand how they do it, you know, uh, how they have such a good attitude with their service. You know, if, if me and you, we were standing somewhere, and, and we were just handing out chicken sandwiches, we were just making milkshakes, if we were just, you know, bagging fries and handing it out, we could probably do that all day. There would be no issue. It, it's not hard to stand, to bag, and to hand. Okay, your, your, your legs might get tired or something. It's not... That, that's not really what's wearing you out as much. It's, it's the people. Man, it's the interaction. When, you, when, when people roll up to your window and they give you attitude or they don't want to pay, uh, they just talk to you like you're dirt, you know, that gets to you. That gets to you, you know? It doesn't take a lot sometimes either, just something. 
but it's so important, Christian, that we go out and that we are a light to the world, that we give God a good name, that we're a representative of this is how a Christian is, this is how Christ would treat people. Very important. Very, very important. We have to be able to do it with smiles on our faces in our life. And that can be very hard, especially when we're worn down. You know, you, you've got to start to recognize when you're worn down. That's going to be the time when the devil attacks. That's going to be the time when it's going to be hardest to serve God, to be a good testimony, to be an ambassador, to give the gospel even. That's going to be the hard time. You know, if I were to do something in retaliation because of the way somebody, yesterday I wanted to tell the guy he was arrogant. So, you're arrogant. Now, if I did that, I am not going to be helping that man to realize his lost condition. I'm going to be burning that bridge. I'm going to be putting up defenses. I'm going to put that man into a state of his mind where he's not going to receive the Gospels. I want to do that. That's what my flesh wants to do. But man, that's why it's so important for us not to get weary, to get broken down. Because when we do, we start to do things that are out of character for ourselves, okay? Now, now <laughs> anybody in customer service, like where you have to deal with folks? Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat, right? I have to go. I have to be an electrician. I'm telling you, for customer service folks, it is like a job requirement that you learn how to fake laugh. Like, you've got to be good at it. Because when you're dealing with folks and they tell you about some joke or something like that, I mean, if you just stand there and you look at them after they tell you something or they, they tell you about your grandkids, I mean, that's, you're not having good customer service interactions with people. And so that fake laugh is very important. You guys, can you give me a fake laugh? <laughs> oh, doesn't that make your skin crawl a little bit? <laughs> The fake laugh, no. You know, uh, that would be a real job qualification. But not only do we get tired physically, not only do we get tired mentally, but we also get tired emotionally. We get tired in our emotions, you know, in our minds with, with wrestling with dysfunctional relationships in our lives, unrealized dreams, things we thought were going to go better, but they didn't pan out the way that we thought, uh, and heartbreaking losses, heartbreaking losses, things that happened in our lives. With our kids, things we see them go away, um, you know, apostasy, we see them follow a false religion, uh, we see heartbreak, we see kids out of wedlock, things that just tear us apart. You know, they, they drain us, they, they take a toll on us. Now, somebody had told me this was about 10 years ago and it stuck with me, never get two, never get two. And so I thought, never get two, okay. Never get too tired, Never get too hungry and never get too busy. Because when those things start to creep in, those three things right there, when you're tired, you're not yourself. When you're hungry, you're not yourself. And when you're too busy, you're not yourself. They start to wear you down. When you're tired, you know, your mind starts to slip and you're weak. You know, thoughts that come in that you used to be able to maybe guard yourself from, well, I'm tired. And now those things come in and it feels, although physically you're fine, it feels like there's this rock on top of your head, this burden in your mind, and it hurts. And it weighs down your spirit. You know, there's, there's a jungle of beliefs out there. And so somebody may try to cast doubt on what I believe with uh, that salvation is eternal. And this person maybe sounds really, really good and convincing. And they can even take you to verses in the King James. And man, if I'm tired I'm, and I don't have that defense, I don't have that wall, I don't have, I can be beat down and I can let that man come into my mind rent free and stomp all over my beliefs. I don't think that any of us should be like that. None of us should be like that. Don't get too tired. You know, don't, don't go too long without rest. You need it. You need it, Christian. I feel like I'm talking to you every time I say that, Christian. I'm so sorry. I'll say friend. No, good. All right. Now, not only never get too tired, but also never get too hungry. Your body is a vessel. Your body needs fuel. Your body is a tabernacle, a fleshly tabernacle, and it absolutely needs food. It needs sustenance in order to operate. There is a time that the Bible tells us that we should pray and that we should fast. Absolutely. But if you don't eat, you're going to get hangry. And if you're not prepared for it, you might just let something slip. You might just snap on something. You might ruin that testimony that you have. And it just takes just like that. It's so simple. You know, we, we can't get too low on our own fuel. Sometimes uh, you need a coffee or, or you need a candy bar to pick you up and give you a, maybe a second win in combat zones when, when, uh, when the, the Marines, or, or especially the Marines, because I would talk with them. I think we have some Marines back here. When they go out to combat zones, they put little special things in the MREs, like uh, little candies or little gums, and, or maybe even like a little hot coffee, and you've got this little packet that warms it up. 
And then what it does is when you get something like that and you've been without it for a few days, woo, man, it's like a second wind. It picks you up. It, it gets you out of that wallowy mire. And so sometimes that's exactly what we need too. We need the exact same. Don't ever get too hungry. You know, that special pick-me-up in your spirit can also come uh, by reading the word, by praying to God, by having a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ just, just woo, give you that second wind, that little pick-me-up. And so that's another thing right there. Never get too tired. Never get too hungry. And never get too busy. When there's too much going on in your life, you're stretched thin. There's only so much of you, brother. There's only so much of you that you can that you can give to. You've got your wife. You've got your ministry. You've got your kids. You've got your family. Uh, you've got um, maybe this other thing going on in your life. And then you've got, on top of that, you have to work. And that's taking a ton of your time. And then on top of that, you've got a, a dying relative. You've got over here some people who aren't saved. Um, that you're trying to get to. And then also, you've got calls coming in from other people, your friends that need your time, that need your help, maybe. And so all of these things, and if you try to do everything, you're going to stretch yourself so thin that eventually you're going to tear, you're going to rip, you're going to break. And that's when you become weak. It's a common problem. We all have it. Never get too tired. Never get too hungry. Never get too busy. You know, when we think about what's the most important thing, God. God is the most important thing in your life. The next thing is your family. Your family. You know, the ministry, that's, that's all the way down here. The ministry that you have within the church, that ministry that you have. I, I could spend literally hours a day away from my family soul winning. And would it be good? Yeah. But it's not as important as me ministering to my first ministry. My first one that God gave me is my family. And that's the one that I have to take care of. God, family, ministry. And that's how I look at it. If I, don't have, if I don't have a family, first of all, I don't have love for God. If I don't have a family, I would not have a ministry. It's a requirement. First Timothy chapter 3. All right. all right. Don't get too tired. Don't get too hungry. Don't get too busy. That's when your defenses go down. When your defenses go down, uh, that's when your family or you, that's when the unit is weak. And that's when the attacks can come. When you're weak. Recognize, oh, man, I'm tired. I haven't been resting. I'm hungry. I need some food or else I'm going to snap. Or I'm stretched too thin. Let me back up. I need to not agree to do a couple of things today. Or we've been doing things for a few days in a row, and I need to stop. I need to focus back. I need to pull back. I need to get back into reading my Bible every morning, and I need to get back into spending time with my family. That's, that is absolutely what you need to do. You're going to get worn out. That fatigue, it, it can take down the strongest people. Christian, I know you're strong, but you're not strong enough. You're not perfect. That is going to creep into your life if you try to do too much. Now, it, ironically, in a way as well, this is, you know, we're tired spiritually from trying to live up to our faith. We have this perfect book, a perfect Jesus Christ example, and we try to do those things, but we fail. The spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 14. You know, I was telling you about, you know, how our spirit is willing. Is willing. It really is, but our flesh is weak. We're stuck in this body. You have, just imagine, two buckets, and they're full of water. They represent you. They represent me. They're full of water. You take one bucket, and you make a hole in the bottom of it the size of a baseball. And then on this one right here, you make a hole in it the size of a pin needle. Now, which one's going to get empty first? The baseball one. But they're both going to get empty. They're both eventually going to be empty. It's just a matter of time. It's the same way with us, the representative of us. You know, a lot of the time what the world will teach is to increase your fuse. Man, I'm short-tempered, I'm short-fused. People say, just like that I can snap and, and be like a rattlesnake and psh, attack somebody. You know, we ought not be that way, Christian. We ought to have a long fuse. Now, you're going to have a fuse because you're human and, and you get fatigued and you get worn down. But I want to be the bucket that's got the pin needle in it that is patient and long-suffering, full of joy, that has uh, a mercy that can be renewed and that lasts a long time. And then I need to take those rests. I need to recognize and then get some of that water put back in. Whereas if I got a giant hole and I'm always trying to fill it up, always trying to fill it up, always trying to fill it up, and it's coming out at such a fast rate, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster right there. Fatigue can also do strange things to us. 
Uh, anybody know Vince Lombardi, the famous football coach? Famous? All right, the Vince Lombardi Trophy, Green Bay Packers. Uh, I'm not a sports guy. <laughs> it's just a good quote. Vince Lombardi, a great football coach, once said, fatigue makes cowards out of us all. There was a businessman who worked very, very long hours in his life. And uh, arriving home one evening, he found his seven-year-old son waiting for him at the door. And the son said to him, he said, Daddy. Yeah. The businessman replied, Daddy, how much money do you make an hour? And he said, well, son, I don't really think that's any business of yours. Please, please, Daddy, tell me, how much do you make an hour? Pleaded this little boy. If I tell you, you must promise that you won't tell anybody else. I promise, said the little boy. All right, then, said his father. I make $150 an hour. Oh, the little boy replied. He looked and a little bit sad, and he looked back at his father and he said, may I borrow 20 bucks, please? His father was furious. He got angry. He yelled at him. The only reason that you wanted to know how much money I make is so that way you could borrow money, go to your room, get out of my sight, go to bed. The little boy, he was seven years old, burst into tears, ran into his room, he started crying. About an hour later, that father, he calmed down. He said, I love my son. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to talk to him. I'll give him 20 bucks as long as it's something that's worth buying. You know, he goes in and he says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, son. I didn't mean to get so angry and upset with you. You wanted 20 bucks. Tell me why you wanted the $20 so that way I can give it to you. It's just got to be something worthwhile. It's got to be something good. The little boy, he ran across his room. He took his piggy bank. He started pulling money out. Seven years old. Pulled out $130. Father looked and said, $130? That's a lot of money, son. What are you saving up for? Surely you can buy whatever it is for $130. He said, well, this is what the son said, with the $20 that you're going to give me, I'd like to buy an hour of your time. You know, fatigue is the one thing that makes a strong man not want to run that extra mile. It, it just beats us down. It makes cowards out of us all. And we can do something that's that we're going to regret that we're not going to be happy about. I, I can tell you of dozens of times in which fatigue has worn me down or somebody I know, and then they've approached a situation the way that they should not have. They shouldn't have approached that situation the way that they did. It actually ended up damaging that relationship. And then also fatigue can affect entire generations. You know, we think about uh, Israel wandering in the wilderness. The wilderness wanderings uh, in the book of Numbers. And the Israelites, you know, they, 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 uh, they didn't have a resolve to go into that promised land. At the very gates of Kadesh Barnea, uh, you know, they sent in the 12 spies. When they came back, only two of them, only two, Caleb and Joshua, the future leaders of that nation, they were the only ones that came back and said, God has promised us, let's go in, because there's nothing that's going to stop us. And the other ten, they gave an evil report. And because of that, everybody had to go into the wilderness and wander for 40 long years. You know, fatigue can wear us down, and, and, and it can make us do and say things that normally would be very strange. And the Israelites, they cried in the wilderness. You have to imagine, these are the exact same people who were crying against God, the same God that just brought them miraculously out of Egypt. With all of those signs and all of those wonders, all of those miraculous things that, that he did for them, and yet here they are, the same generation, the same people, that saw it with their very eyes, they are, are complaining against God, and they wish that they would go back to Egypt. They remember the cinnamon and the gourds and the food and the bread and the water, and they said, we had need of nothing there. But they were slaves. They were bondmen. Yet they're saying right there, you know, the, the, the fatigue, when it sets in, it, it can wear anybody down. It does strange things to us, the strongest of us, even to the people who have been following the Lord, seen his miracles, felt his warm embrace, had, had been delivered from things, and yet still that fatigue, when it sets in, why? Because it's a common problem that we all have. There's a common problem, it's fatigue. Now, that doesn't, it doesn't stop there. Oh, no, it gets better. Now, because of that common problem, we have Jesus Christ and his comforting promise. What does he say back here in Matthew chapter 11? 
Uh, he says right here, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He promises us, I will give you rest. You know, if, if just anybody made you that promise, it wouldn't really mean much to you. If a politician came up to you and said, I will give you rest, you know, just elect me in November. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to believe it. If a doctor even came up to me and said, uh, you have stage four cancer, but I will give you rest, uh, I would say, okay, thank you. You know, I, I trust you. You're a professional. That's great. But it's not nearly the same as the perfect Son of God, the Creator of everything, my Lord and Savior, who died for me, who can't lie, the book of Titus tells us. And he says right here, come unto me, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. That's a promise that you can stand on. That's a promise you can take to the bank twice on Sundays. It's true. You know, it's not one of those things that we take with a grain of salt. There's just simply things that people can't do for us. But God can. When Jesus Christ makes us a promise, we stop and we listen. Because his promises are anything but empty. He has both the integrity, because he's God, because he's perfect, and the power, because he's sovereign, he's omniscient, to deliver on his word. So whatever he says is absolute truth. You remember Pontius Pilate? As he debated what, what he was going to do with Christ, and they cried out, crucify him, yet he found no fault in him. And it's truth incarnate, stood or kneeled or lay beaten and broken in front of him. Pontius Pilate said, what is truth? What is truth? Jesus Christ is truth. The word. His promises are anything but empty. We should be grasping and clinging to his promises. Because he said that he will give us rest. Think back. My boss, if he were to promise to give me rest, I mean, I'd be like, okay, he has some power. Now, if he were to talk about giving me a raise or a Christmas bonus, my ears are going to perk up and I'm going to be listening to uh, you know, a lot more. But would you, at a time even like now, you read something like this in the Bible. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Would it be something that you would stop and you would take seriously and that you would listen to? Well, that's a question for you. I can't answer it for you. I hope you do. We take and we stake our eternal destinies on the reliability of his promises. You know, we trusted God. We trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We put our faith and our hope and our trust and our belief in him to save our eternal souls. Then why can't we take this promise seriously too? promises all these things, rest in life. And I, I, I tell you, the Christian life is the best life. I look out in the world, and, and they look at us, and they say that we're missing out. I've been there. I'm not missing out on anything. The world's got nothing to offer you. They want to chew you up. They want to spit you back out because they don't care about you. God cares about you. Jesus Christ loves you. You go out into that world and you say, I'm going to do my own thing and I'm going to live selfishly and I'm going to pursue the, the dream, the American dream. I'm going to go after the cars. I'm going to go after the women or the boys. I'm going to go after getting the nice house. I'm going to go after the money and getting the job. I'm going to go after the fame. I'm going to go after all the, the things that are going to fill up my mind with pride. And you go after that. And what you're going to find at the end is a world that doesn't care about anything that you just did. All of it's dust. All of it's worthless. None of it matters. None of it. Go ahead and, and, and go. But I'm telling you, you're missing out on the Christian life. Woo! It is a wonderful thing to serve God. You know, one day, we might be given 70 or, or, or four score years, maybe. At the end, which all of us will we'll look back and our life is but a vapor. It will be short. What will we have to show for it? Things that moth and rust will eat up and corrupt and ruin? Or will we have laid up eternal treasures in heaven? And I tell you, you know, the time that I was a teenager was a very short time in the amount of time that I will live my eternal life. My, 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 my humanly mortal life is what I should say. I was a teenager from 
13 to 19. So whatever that is, call me out. Seven, seven years, let's say seven years. In the entirety of my 70, maybe, maybe 80 years, that is one-tenth of my life, and I have nine-tenths, the majority of my life left or, or past, in which I have to live. And, and if I put all of my focus on that time, uh, I'm not going to have anything to show for it. I don't want that. I don't want that for anybody. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best life. It's, it's so much better when you're doing and you're living and you're serving God. I'll leave it at that. Don't want to get too much into it. We all have the same problem, which is fatigue. But we all have the same promise, which comes from Jesus. He promises us. He says, my yoke is, is light. You know, I don't have a, a, a heavy burden for you. And then there comes the prescription, the challenging prescription. Take my yoke upon you, that's us, and learn, and learn of me. So the prescription, that's the part where we come in. You know, we, we all understand we're fatigued. We all understand Jesus Christ has promised to give us rest. Well, how? What do we do? Take my yoke upon you, uh, upon you and learn of me. Jesus doesn't say, uh, I'm going to give you a life where you're going to be sitting back, chilling in a hammock. And your life's going to be so good and so easy. No, he says, change your burden, change your yoke from what you have to my burden and to my yoke. Do my work. Humans, we, me and you, we seek rest by escaping. We seek rest on, on, a, on a labor day. We get this rest on a Monday. We, you know, by relieving ourselves of responsibility. Man, I don't have to wake up early. I don't have to get dressed. I don't have to get into my car. I don't have to drive to work. I don't have to interact with people. I don't have to do anything. Humanly, what we do is we seek rest by simply saying, I'm, I'm shunning and I'm removing all responsibility uh, out of my own life. I'm getting away. And uh, that's how we operate as humans. Parents, you ever been there? You know, you just tell your wife, I just need 20 minutes. I need 20 minutes on the couch. I need 20 minutes alone. I got to get my head right. You're worn out. You're worn out. Instead, Jesus calls us not to that, but to a new task. The Christian life is much different. While we're looking for that hammock, Jesus is calling us to a yoke. He calls us to find rest by voluntarily placing ourselves under that new burden, his burden. And serving God is amazing. It's the best life. I feel bad, I was telling you, I feel bad for those non-Christians out there. They're missing out. When we come here and we do a tissue box tournament, a water, water bottle flip challenge, when we go out and we knock doors and we meet all sorts of people, uh, when we have a lemonade stand, when we do a pumpkin spice coffee stand, when we do these things, it's, it's wonderful. It's joyful, it's glorious, it's amazing, it's fulfilling, and not in a temporary way, but in a, in a way that's everlasting, in a way that we see the fruit of something, and we see the next generation that it's going to be lived out in. It's, it's the best. It's the best. Jesus' words teach us the real cause of fatigue and the nature of true rest. It, it, you know, the problem with our lives isn't that we must work. It's not uh, that we must serve some boss or some master in our lives. It's not even that we should perform some task. The problem really is what work we choose and whom we choose to serve. And so if you've ever had a job, you ever had a soul-sucking job, and that term is used, that soul-sucking job, you go there in spiritual darkness, it feels like you're walking around in mud, soul sucking job. The kind of rest that Jesus is offering is not relief from the task or relief from the tasks that are necessary to sustain us or even freedom from all of life's trials. No. Uh, Jesus didn't even do that with his own disciples. Jesus was tempted and tried in the exact same way as all of us were. Those early disciples who took Jesus up on those promises, they still had to work. They still had to labor for bread. They still had to face life's difficulties. There was betrayal. There was all sorts of things that they went through. They were out in a storm right there, and they still had those fears, those doubts. There's still all sorts of things that they had to deal with. That they, I mean, you remember Paul. Paul was a tent maker. Even when he was in the ministry as he traveled around, he was making tents to provide for himself. He still had to work. You know, he talks about how there was a thorn in his flesh 
that God, that, you know, it came from Satan, but God said, I'm not going to remove it. I'm going to let you keep it, even though you prayed to me about it three different times. You know, he had difficulties with finance because he still had to make tents. He had difficulties in his life because he had those thorns in his flesh. And he even died a cruel death. He was killed for the cause of Christ. So, so just because, uh, you know, we're not going to have these things removed out of our lives just because we're following Christ, that's not what he's saying. He's saying you're going to have a burden. He's saying you're going to have a yoke, but at least you're going to be serving me. The kind of rest Jesus offers is a peace of mind. It's a calmness of spirit that comes from knowing that our lives are being lived within his will, not our own. Not another man, not the devil, not the world, not, the, not your friends or your moms or your dads. No, you're living God's will. It's the kind of rest that accompanies a life that is rescued from self-made anxieties and stresses. Even the unavoidable work of meeting basic needs is made less tiring by the reassurance that the Savior is looking after us. Our boss, our real boss, our true boss is God. Ever met somebody who's worried about anything? They're just worried as dead. They're worried about the weather. They're worried about uh, the presidential election. They're worried about the world, the way in which it's going, and they just worry, they worry, they worry. They're just worried all the time. Now, here is your extra credit. You saw that everybody's tired, everybody's fatigued, but Jesus Christ promises uh, that He is going to take care of us if we carry out His prescription. And His prescription is your burden and your yoke, make it mine, because it's light, because it's an easy burden to have. Here's the extra credit. This is the one that separates that separates Christians. But you brethren, be not weary in well doing. Oh, I can be a Christian, and I can carry my life, and I can do the things I ought to do, but I can get beat down. I can get tired. I can let that sourness come into me, and I can allow other people, the brethren that I'm supposed to encourage and lift up and exhort and, and say, we can go into that promised land, and we can conquer it, and we can absolutely take it because God has promised us. Or I can be one of those other spies. I can be a, a saved Christian and say, yeah, I don't know if God, if God can really do that. I don't know. Have you seen? There's giants in the land. The Amalekites are there. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Don't get tired in what you're doing. It's hard not to. It's absolutely hard not to. There's got to be some things that you put inside of your life that is going to recharge your batteries. I think you know what they are, Christian. You know what they are. Pray. Go to church. Read your Bible. Obey what you read. Go soul when you witness to people. Examine your life. Thank God with prayer. Honor Him with the tithe. Do those basic Christian things in your life. And then when you're doing them, you have a bad attitude. God loveth a cheerful giver. Giving financially, sure, but the giving of your life, the giving of your time, whatever it is, God wants you to do it not because you have to. You're just following Him because you have to and you're doing it with, with your hands, but with your heart also. God's interested in it. Common problem, fatigue in the Christian life, a comforting promise, Jesus will provide our rest, a challenging prescription. You know, it's not the work, because we all have to work, but rather the work of God instead. And that load, that burden, that work, God's work is great. It's amazing. And then that extra credit. Let us not be weary and well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. God sees, and I know sometimes you, you, you think not, God sees that you're faithfully solving. God sees that you're knocking on doors. And he's going to reward it. Just stay faithful in it. Don't get weary. Don't get tired. Don't get beat down. Don't get worried. Keep having faith in God. Keep serving him. Keep doing the right things. And yes, you're going to get worn down. You're going to get beat. Recharge your batteries. Man, get around some other Christians that are, are maybe going through the same thing and lift each other up. Go to church. Read your Bible. Pray to God. Ask for him to renew your spirit inside of you. There's all, all kinds of yokes. We're at the end. There's all kinds of yokes in the world. What yoke are you going to choose to put yourself under? Is it going to be uh, the yoke of ambition? Is it going to be the yoke of greed? Is it going to be the yoke of materialism in this world? Is it going to be uh, a, a, a yoke of lust? Uh, is it going to be a yoke of alcohol, pride? Is it going to be a yoke of just evil, evil in the world? These are the things that truly exhaust you. They truly exhaust me. Because that's a, a heavy burden. That's a heavy yoke. But God promises us rest when we take his burden. 
by placing ourselves under the yoke of the gentle, humble Savior, our lives are liberated from the exhaustion of all of these other cares and all of these other things, all these other yokes that we put ourselves under, and sets us free to work purposefully unto true satisfaction and true fulfillment in our lives. Now, we're at the end. That was it. That's the sermon. But the question is, how about you? Are you tired? Are you beat down? Are you worried? Are you fatigued? God says right here, Matthew chapter 11, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will, I will give you rest. Brother Justin, if you could go on the piano, we'll have a quick invitation time. An invitation time, it's simply this, it's a, it's a time where we can do business with God. Please stand with me. Standing, if you'd like to come forward at this time and pray, do business with God. We just bow our hearts, we bow our heads, sometimes we bow our knees. We get before the Lord, and you can make a prayer even today, something about, Lord, I'm, I'm tired, I've been going through it, Lord. Please be with me. You, you, you tell me that you'll make, that your burden and your yoke is light, Lord. Tell me more. I want to serve you, God. Help me to cast off the yoke of the, the world. Help me to cast off the yoke of, of the lust of the flesh. Help me to cast off the yoke of the, the evils of this world. Help me to cast off all selfishness, God, and to serve you as a piano player. Please, sir. Take Jesus' yoke. Take Jesus.
Jesus is burdened upon you. Man. Makes a difference. Brother Brandon, at this time, would you please pray our service out? Dear right. Lord, thank you for the message that we received today. It's very much needed. Uh, Lord, we just felt you beat us down and burdened us. You say the word that you're, you're willing to fight for us. 